We can hear you. You can hear me. Yes. Okay. Now, what you can hear me? Don't lie to me. Okay. So this is a talk that might be called more of that stuff we were just talking about, and uh, which is you know semi-accidental, but also uh, good. So I'm going to talk about how attosecond pulses are generated, and I'm a theorist, so I'm going to talk about it from a theoretical point of view. But I want to convince you that it's really uh, a very interesting process that couples both time and space in a way that, that uh, allows for attosecond light to be generated. So first, let me say that uh, I'm from Louisiana State University, and there, Medegarda and I run an attosecond theory group professors there, and we have a number of talented um, postdocs and students that have contributed to the work that you will see today, especially a postdoc named Meng Shi Wu. Um, and also there are two students from the group, Paul, who is there, and Noah, who is there with the beard. Let's just clear about it. Uh, <laughs> that are here, and you can talk to them as well. And um, so in our own little theoretical bubble, uh, we would know very little. But we've had, over the years, many, many experimental collaborators, especially these first two groups, Anne Loyer and Ron Moritzen at Lund University, which, if you don't know, is a university in southern Sweden, just across the channel from Denmark. And Lou de Moro, who, was, uh, who is in Ohio State University now, and a bunch of other people that we've worked with over the years. And, um, this is something that you know I could just really recommend highly to you if you're planning a career as a theorist, uh, especially in a field like ultrafast physics, which is really technologically driven and driven by very clever people doing experiments. You really need to somehow figure out how to get these people to talk to you, and that's what we've been lucky to do over the years, and we've learned a lot from that. So what I want to talk to you about is something that we sort of specialize at LSU in, which is that we have a focus on treating strong field single atom physics, but also coupled to the propagation of the driving and emitted radiation. So both the propagation of the femtosecond IR pulses that you've been hearing about, and also the propagation of the emitted XUV radiation that you've been hearing about, to sort of how does this actually yield something that you see in an experiment. And so the shorthand for this is that we solve both the time-dependent Schrodinger equation in some approximation and the Maxwell wave equation in some approximation at the same time. And we try and do both of these things as well as we can so that we can understand uh, which of the effects that are seen are microscopic, which is to say they occur at the single atom level, and which of them are macroscopic phenomena, which is to say they the induced polarization in each atom works together to make a polarization in the medium that leads to the emission or absorption, as I'll talk about in the next two lectures of light. So this lecture is really about the emission of light. Uh, the next two lectures are about the absorption of light, but it's the same sort of story both times. And so to do this, uh, we've, when you put this together, we think of this as a numerical nonlinear medium. So you've been hearing about actual physical nonlinear we make a numerical nonlinear medium, and this allows us to separate the microscopic single atom effects from the macroscopic propagation effects. And we do this because it's really the only way that I know of to look at these things independently and how they interact and really break them apart. In experiments, you can try and do this. Um, there's two sort of barriers to it. Number one, people are usually not interested in figuring out exactly how their experiment, how their production of light work. They're, they're interested in using the light. If you go to them and you ask them to really take apart their experiment and do it in great detail for the, and walk around the whole parameter space and figure out how it really works, they're not going to keep talking to you because they want to get on with their lives. The other thing is to really figure out to separate microscopic and macroscopic effects. The easiest way to do that is you would sort of eliminate the macroscopic effects and you would make them as small as possible and you would really like to get to the single atom limit. That's also the limit of no photons. So it's a, you know, that's a, that's a common problem. Perfect data comes from no signal, right? Okay, so, so there's a real, that's my pitch for why you would want to do this numerically. We did not build this numerical nonlinear medium to sort of do optimization problems or quantum control problems 
it's still sort of beyond uh, the uh, technology to do things like that. But it is a very good tool for understanding what's going on. So anyway, enough of that. The equations that we'll solve, the whole point of the numerical nonlinear medium is that we can march in time and space. So we solve the TDSE by marching forward in time from some initial condition to some final condition. And we march the Maxwell wave equation from the back of the medium where the driving laser enters out to the front and see what comes out the front. And then you can look at it in the near field, in the far field, you can bounce it off a mirror. All of these things correspond to mathematical operations that you can do on the signal once it has actually emerged from the medium. So it's, it's marching. Um, and then there are two messages here. The space-time coupling, there's space-time coupling inherent in all high harmonic generation experiments and at a second pulse generation experiments. Um, and theory is the way to unravel these, and then this is sort of the take home message, the at a second pulses. They're really generated by a macroscopic number of ionizing medium, uh, ionizing atoms, interacting with the focused laser beam. So you have to you have to treat that in order to see what's really going on, which is unfortunate because it would be easier just to think about one equation or the other. I admit that. So here are sort of some main ideas, in case I don't have time to finish. The first is sort of one of my favorites, which is that single atoms don't produce out of second pulses. So, you know, you, you have to get at that. The radiation that is emitted by single atoms, if you want to think of single atoms as emitting radiation, it still has to be filtered in frequency, in time or space, and frequently all three in order to actually produce a usable at a second pulse. So the idea that there's an atom sitting there and you do something to it and it emits an at a second pulse and it's just n times that is what's going on in your experiment where n is your number of atoms is just false. Um, now, that said, there is an at a second time scale at the single atom level. That's what we've been talking about. This is the ionization, the acceleration, the return of the electron each half cycle of the laser field. The, three-step model that was worked out in Ottawa and in Livermore in the early 90s. Um, any process that produces usable at a second pulses relies on combining this mi these microscopic time scale with macroscopic effects. And, and so we see here the space-time coupling inherent in high harmonic generation, at least I hope to convince you is inherent. It allows many experiments to see, succeed, even if you don't really understand why they succeed when they do, because there's often a simple-minded microscopic uh, explanation, and then you ignore everything else and say, well, my experiment worked because I measured some light. So my favorite example is the first measurement of a single atosecond pulse, which was made in 2001 by Ferenc Krauss and collaborators. That was not understood at the time. It worked. The explanation that was given was not true. Uh, as as Ferenc would, would uh, freely admit, um, not, you know, very loudly, but... Uh, uh, but they were very helpful, in, and we used this numerical nonlinear medium in an early application to sort of figure out why their experiment had worked. And it's kind of a fun story. It's not meant to, as a, to deprecate anything. It's an amazingly wonderful experiment that was done in 2000. Just use it as an illustration. Here's the sort of, uh, on the theorist, so we have to have a lot of equations. I actually don't have a lot of equations, so I took the equations that I had and I put them up front. But this is basically where we're <coughs> going to get to, which is we're going to be solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which you recognize here, where I have an electron, or electrons, that are driven by some time-dependent field. And um, we will calculate the time-dependent dipole from the Schrodinger equation by marching forward in time, starting with some initial condition going forward. And then we're going to solve Maxwell's equation by marching forward in space. So we're going to take the polarization that we get out of solving the Schrodinger equation at some point in the gas, and we're going to use that to march forward. So D, dz here is where I, am I in the gas. Z equals zero is the beginning of the gas, and I have a first order equation in Z. And so this is going to allow me to specify an initial condition at the back end of the gas and space march my way forward, plane by plane by plane, to the end. I'll explain better how this works. But 
how are these things coupled? Well, it's this line right here. The polarization is this Fourier transformed polarization, so the same way Paul used it, is given by the density of atoms somewhere in the gas times the single atom time dependent dipole, Fourier transform, that is a function of the driving field at that point in the gas. Yes? Uh, question maybe because I was distracted for a minute. Uh, why did you drop the second derivative in Z? It's coming. Okay. So the, yeah. So the second derivative um, makes it impossible to do this space marching thing. So right. we have to get rid of that because the second derivative gives you oh, right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And so what you'll see is by we have dropped the second derivative in what is essentially the paraxial approximation. Right. And what you're ignoring then is is light that goes backwards. Right. And we're interested in the driven coherent process that that generates light that goes forward. But and does it make you nervous or very short pulses to do that? Ah, to do it for very short pulses? Yeah. No. No. I'll show you nervous. that. We'll get to that. Okay. So this is actually something called the slowly evolving wave approximation, which um, Thomas Bravich worked out in the late 90s. And it really is amazing because it works as long as you can ignore the backward propagating light, which you know basically these experiments are done at gas densities. So this is not a problem. Uh, this actually works down to the single cycle limit. Yeah. And, and, um, and Andre Vondrak and collaborators have solved the full uh, Maxwell wave equation in these conditions, and they get nothing different, okay. as they shouldn't, because the approximations really are very good. Yes? Oh, so, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Blue sweatshirt. Okay, so uh, is it a single electron wave function? Or? It can be what you want. So what is my initial state? Is it the Your initial state is the ground state. Okay. So the atoms are just hanging around. And then along comes the laser pulse. Um, so, and again, I put this here just to sort of say what we're going to see later. Do you, do you take the the course space, the uh, atomic wave course space, so they are they don't move in the field, right? They don't move in the time that it takes the field to go by, which is a few femtoseconds. <coughs> That's right. Yeah, ten femtoseconds, they don't move right. That's true. Yes. Um, so it looks like you were not implementing the full E algorithm for your uh, Maxwell's equations? The full what? E algorithm? Uh, no. So this is just, you know, again, this is the equation that you want to solve. And I, you know, uh, it is, uh, the, the whole point of it is, I mean, I'll, I'll show you the derivation in a little while. But the whole point of it is that here, I wanted to just to see that here you have a first derivative in time of the wave function. So you're marching forward in time. And here you have a first derivative, derivative of, the, um, of the position along here. And let me put you a little bit at ease. This is actually, this equation is derived in a, in a coordinate system that moves at the speed of light through the, through the medium. So this is where the first derivative comes from. When you make that, when you make that jump to the moving system. You generate a cross term, which is this first derivative. And, and that's the thing that turns out to be much more important than the second derivative term which you can draw. And then um, in your Hamiltonian for the in the Schrodinger equation? Yes. Are you using a, a two level atom? No, most often what we do is, is we do the single active electron approximation. So this would be uh, a one electron wave function for some valence electron, for instance, in the outer shell of neon or argon. And this would be a pseudopotential that describes that. But, you know, so okay. just, you can think of it in that way. So uh, I'm confused by how you move it to become moving frame at the speed of light. So is will it get a okay. transformation? Or? We, will, we will get to that. I, I can see now throwing the equations up front. <laughs> so the second question, what, yes. what is D? What is the, the uh, D equals rho times So D here is the dipole moment of the single atom. So the, so the Schrodinger equation generates D somewhere in the gas, depending on what the electric field that it's driving it is at that point in the gas. But it's a multi-atoms. 
Yes. Uh, yes. So you, I cannot take the electrons separately, or can I? Perhaps we get to that. <laughs> okay. So moving along, I mean, I understand the question, but it's a much better answer than just a few minutes. So the problem that we're trying to solve was laid out well by Paul, because you'd like to break through this femtosecond barrier. And Maxwell's equations basically say that if you've got less than one cycle of the radiation, you're not going to be able to take a pulse and move it undistorted somewhere else. So you can make sub-cycle pulses, but they're just, you can think of them as like blobs of jello, and that's not very useful. So you'd like to get beyond that femtosecond barrier. This requires an enormous bandwidth. Uh, so to give you the scale of what you need to do, here's a 5 femtosecond IR pulse. It has a bandwidth of a fraction of electron volt. This is huge, hard to make, high technology, but it's still more than it's 5 femtoseconds long. So, and what you really want to do is you somehow want to take that sub-EV bandwidth and use it to make something that has about 30 electron volts of bandwidth, right? That's, this is a 150 attosecond pulse. Fourier transform. So here's the here's the uh, bandwidth limited bandwidth of 150 attosecond pulse. Here's my five femtosecond pulse, right? So that's sort of the problem you're trying to solve. That's a very nonlinear problem, right? And of course, just to remind you, the pulse length in the best case is related to the bandwidth by this relationship. This is for Gaussian pulses, and of course, this assumes this is the group delay. This T sub G. So you have to make a lot of frequencies, and you have to get them to all show up at the same place at the same time. That's a short pulse. Right? Both of those things have to happen, so that's hard. So here's my movie, and this is a movie from an actual calculation with the time of Schrodinger equation, and there is the time of wave packet. And we'll see this movie twice, but this is basically a calculation. It's done in neon, uh, 8 times 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter. So watch it now. This is, we're looking at the electron density. Here's the potential. And you'll see as it starts, you get this wave packet that comes out. It really does. Part of it really is driven back. Now we got another wave packet over here, so we got a lot of interference going on. But this is a solution to the time to time Schrodinger equation. You can do it in whatever gauge you want. You get the same answer because I'm uh, what I'm showing you here is the uh, wave function squared, which is a gauge independent quantity. So you do the calculation different ways in different gauges and make sure you see the same thing. So Sometimes you will hear people say, it's a two-dimensional product. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's in R and Z, and then there is, oh, and there is cylindrical symmetry. Okay. Sometimes you will hear people say that, that tunneling is sort of a gauge dependent uh, concept because, of course, this idea of the distorted potential uh, uses a particular form of the of the interaction, and this is undoubtedly true, right? The distorted the potential that I write down is different in different gauges, but the wave function square that I calculate is not different, and I would uh, submit that there seems to be a wave packet coming out there. So I I, I like to know. And so you get this comb of odd harmonics that's been seen since 1987. There's a lot of bandwidth here. Right? You take a, a selection of harmonics, and there's a huge amount of bandwidth. And so maybe you have what you need to make a short pulse. So that's good. And so you have, again, this sort of three-step model of ionization. Uh, you pick up energy in the field. Uh, the part of the wave packet that has picked up energy uh, enters the same spatial region where the ground state still is, and this gives you a time-dependent dipole. It's this overlap between a piece of the wave function that's in the continuum and a piece of the wave function that is still in the ground state. They have phases that vary at very different rates, and the difference in those phases gives you the time-dependent dipole. And so there really is a, a short time scale event here. And so you get this sort of XUV generation. You have the low order harmonics are sort of perturbative, still going down like you would think. But then you get this, this plateau, which here it goes out to the 30th harmonic order. It can go out to the 300th or the 1,000th. And then you get a cutoff. And the position of this cutoff depends basically just on the intensity of the laser that you're using. The 
scale where this plateau is, which is, that was the question about the conversion efficiency, that depends on everything. So that's, that's what the experimentalist is always trying to optimize. And so you have these what we would call recollision based at a second light sources that are sort of based on the idea that depending on when the electron tunnels, uh, that defines a time when it will return, and this gives you a time scale for this at a second emission. So um, you have single and multiple at a second pulses that are routinely made in the 20 to 100 EV range, sometimes beyond, uh, not much. So, and so you get this sort of simple single atom theory. Yes? We also have uh, to ask uh, questions. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in previous slide, yes. uh, <clears throat> I, I can't exactly remember what, did, what was done in that CUDA and the 93 paper. So, with presumably some TDSC calculation. But then, what you described here is uh, the three step model. So, yes. did, at that time, did anyone try to compare fully of nature TDSC with TDSC based on just kind of continuum and ground state, which is essentially what you have in the future. Well, well now, now we go through a bunch of, now we go through history. But I mean, the, the, the paper that, that I would, so call it a paper, there's a paper from our group uh, in collaboration with Lou DeMoros that, that appeared at the same time, as a note about Paul's paper, saying Paul's paper is coming. Mm -hmm. um, and that compares uh, TDSE calculations to experiments on photoelectrons and high harmonics. And then the, essentially the three-step model is at the end of that paper because it says, why would these two cutoffs be different? For us, that was the motivation. Okay. Right? So for us, the, what I went around asking people for a while is, why is the high harmonic cutoff different from the photoelectron cutoff? And the photoelectron cutoff wasn't measured because they had only low repetition rate lasers at that time. So that's something that came with the high repetition rate laser. So also it was sort of known from calculation, TDSE calculations that we were doing that you could get the same high harmonic spectrum by just taking account of the electron wave packet in the continuum and the ground state. And then you would get the whole thing, yeah. So we did full calculations and then approximate calculations that way. And I'll show you that expression the next time. And then Machak Levenstein, uh, in, along with some other things, took that as you know good evidence that the strong field approximation would work. So I think it all kind of falls together, along with the classical view. Uh, anyway, this leads to what I want to use as a straw man. Um, yes. So. Um, you're using the classical description of the electromagnetic field. Yes. And um, so as far as I know, people use these when there's a uh, large number of phones and yes. fields can be described as a coherent boson. Yes. So is it true in this case? How yes. many photons are generated by So the that's right. So typically what we teach, if you teach a quantum optics course, you say you're, you, you have to quantize the field if you have sort of one or, one or so photons per cubic wavelength. That would be a good thing, right? So you ask the wavelength of your light, and you say, how many photons on average are there in a cubic wavelength? And we have no So we're good. But it's an excellent question. Yeah. So the, electri so the electromagnetic field here is, is classical, but it's driven by a quantum mechanical system. So, which is a, f a familiar step in quantum, you know, if you take a quantum optics course, right? They'll spend uh, time in that before you quantize the electromagnetic field. First, you have a classical electromagnetic field and a quantized atom. So here's the sort of simple story: is that if you had a single pulse, say an 80 out of second pulse, you would get that if you could restrict your electron to return basically just one time. Right? If you had just one of these ionization and return events, you get a single pulse. And if you repeat this process many, many half cycles you'll get a train of out of second pulses. And indeed, this does; these are the two sort of uh, categories of sources, shall we say. 
people do experiments. They make out of second pulse trains, they make single pulses. It isn't this simple, let's say, especially the first one. So let me just quickly say one way that you could think about doing the TDSE calculation, because I actually want to defer that until the next lecture and not really talk about that. I want to talk to you today about the space-time coupling. So that really means talking about the Maxwell wave equation. But just to give you a, an example of how you would do this in the single active electron approximation, you would calculate some ground state wave function in a single active electron. So you'd have a pseudo-potential for the other electrons that you may maybe better Hartree-Fock or a better calculation, whatever is your favorite way of doing this. This will give you an initial state that, de that describes the um, valence electron state as if it were the ground state of the pseudo-potential. Then you do a numerical integration of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. For each step in time, you evaluate something, the time-dependent dipole, the time-dependent velocity, the time-dependent acceleration, whatever's, whatever you like. Uh, this is something that will allow you to calculate the polarization response of a single atom. And then the dipole <coughs> spectrum, or again, the velocity or acceleration, is given by taking that time-dependent signal and Fourier transform. So that's sort of, these are the elements of the single atom. We need a ground state, we need a time-dependent wave function, we get a time-dependent response. After the whole pulse is over, we Fourier transform that and get a frequency response, which is, has both an amplitude and a phase. And so, how does that correspond to the trajectory picture? Well, the trajectory, in the trajectory picture, the trajectory depends on the time of release, and then it can have zero, one, or multiple returns to the ion core. So for instance, this is time, this is distance away from the atomic core, and you can see, depending on very small differences in the ionization time, you can have an electron that just sort of drifts away, an electron that just sort of keeps bouncing back. Its energy, when it returns, is the derivative of this curve. So you can see here the energy is very low at the time of return. Here is an example of a trajectory that has three returns. It has an early return with pretty high energy. It has a second return and an even longer return. So it has a short, long, and longer trajectory. You might think of it that way. And then it drifts away. You might say, how realistic is this? Here's a, a full calculation, time-dependent Schrodinger equation. This is for actually two electrons in one dimension, but I've done a cut here along one dimension. And so again, I have time going this way, and I have distance away from the atom going this way. Here's the electric field that's driving this. So you can see it turns on. It's pretty flat in amplitude, and then it turns off at some point. And you can see that these space-time trajectories look pretty real, I would say, right? because you really can identify ionization events where you have, again, these wave packets going on. And you really do have kind of return events, and then the whole thing turns off. So what, sorry, what are those? Um, this is like air or spaghetti. Why, why are this, the amplitude split, split into the spaghetti? Yeah, why is it sort of a, yeah. it's an interference pattern from all the different ways that it can happen. So you always see that when you plot the wave function. Fine. Yeah, you, you, don't, you only know, you only know what you have at the time you ask the question. And if there are multiple ways to have gotten that answer, then you'll always get these striking patterns across there. You'll get an appearance. Can, can the, the flat cutoffs are the absorbing boundary conditions that you have put on the At the outside there? Yeah. There's an absorber somewhere. It's it's very far away. But things at the top and the bottom. It's, 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 yeah, I think I think just that's not just something I've done to to, to make plotted. it clear. I think it's just a cut. Now the, the box is much bigger. <coughs> I don't know. So just to be completely clear, uh, what do you describe? Is it just one initial condition, or, or did you take? Which so back back here at zero time before the electron is turned on, we're just hanging around in the ground state. Okay. And then you turn on the... And then I just plot the density. That's it. As a function of time, that's right. And so most of the density, right, where it's really high along here, this corresponds to the electron staying in its ground state. Right. 
I mean, Paul talked.